what I'll talk about today is, uh, uh, and I, I really enjoyed the, the uh, forest talks uh, this morning and the, uh, the rooting zone, but I, I'm going to move it out to the prairies um, in the interest of time and, and talk about some soil moisture and hydrological relationships in Western Canada and, uh, and, and where this is moving in terms of assessment of, of things such as best management practices and, and, and others. So the, uh, right there's the laser. And I uh, want to recognize uh, some of my co-authors. Uh, Jing Fang goes by Logan Fang, uh, was a master's student and has been a research officer for 10 years now and a very, very good hydrological modeler. Uh, Tofik Mahmoud, uh, another hydrological modeler working on BMPs in Manitoba. Uh, my colleague Howard Wheater, uh, who's the Canada Excellence Research Chair in Water Security at the University. And uh, Tom Brown, who is probably uh, the longest record of hydrological modeling, I think now in the world, um, because he was hired in 1970 to, by the Division of Hydrology at the University of the time to start. Uh, computer simulations of hydrology in Western Canada, and he's still going, which is astonishing. So, anyway, uh, let's step back to the prairie hydrological cycle, and we'll sort of step back and get a view of where soils and water fit in uh, the general schematic over the prairies. And so, of course, we have the atmosphere up on top, uh, radiation uh, long and short wave coming in, but the uh, uh, some very distinctive uh, prairie precipitation systems that are of great interest to us. And the, uh, uh, the, the, the one is the, uh, the uh, and this is associated with the climate system, so one being the very long winter, uh, the uh, dominance of snow over that period of time. Snowfall as a proportion of total precip is not that high. It's uh, anywhere from 20 to 35 percent over the prairies, yet it's very effective in generating runoff. In the summertime, the uh, precip that we think uh, that we find tends to be very interesting are uh, intense rainstorms from convective systems, the classic prairie thunderstorms, and, and these can have a tremendous impact at small scales, but they don't tend to drive the uh, hydrology at larger scales. They're too small to, uh, to affect the large river basins like the Red Deer or the, uh, the Peace. And, uh, and so it's the frontal systems uh, which uh, may have scales of hundreds of kilometers of rain and persistence over several days that are more hydrologically uh, interesting for us. Uh, now when you get into the surface, um, we've got uh, the long winter, redistribution of snow by wind, very cold snowpacks, um, you know, mid central Saskatchewan prairies on a cold winter's day in January. You can't distinguish the climate too much from that of the Arctic on a particular day. In fact, Saskatoon is colder than a Calumet, uh in Baffin Island yesterday. So, the, uh, so we have this uh, sort of semi-Arctic condition for a few weeks or months in the winter, uh, and then snow melt. But the, uh, uh, the cold has affected the prairies in many ways, and one was glaciation. And the the landscape itself has not primarily been formed by fluvial erosion, by erosion from uh, dendritic networks of, of streams. Uh, a lot of the landscape is formed by the deposits of ice and moraine till in the glaciers. And where there were uh, large ice deposits, uh, we now have internally drained wetlands um, in uh, the knob and kettle terrain or prairie pothole region uh, with uh, no natural outflow in terms of stream flow. And then we'll have larger lakes. Um, of course, we cultivate large areas of it. And another legacy of the glaciers is uh, what we tend to call as, uh, the glacial till. It tends to be heavy clay layer. It's effectively an aquitard on, uh, on any uh, uh, confined aquifers below it. But it means that very often our agricultural soils are perched on what is effectively an impermeable layer. And th this has tremendous implications for us because uh, it means that we generally don't have uh, uh, high levels of groundwater recharge. Irrigation of groundwater is effectively not an option for us as it is in many other agricultural areas. We'll never have an Ogallala aquifer problem here because we, we can't use that sort of water. The, uh, the aquifers which are there are very deep. They tend to be uh, uh, very high in dissolved solids and uh, barely potable in some cases is certainly not usable for irrigation. Um, we still do manage to get rivers to discharge off the region, though many of them, like the Saskatchewan River system, are essentially exotic 
in the same sense of the Nile, in that they receive very small parts of their runoff and discharge as they cross the prairies. The uh, South Saskatchewan River at Saskatoon, 1% of its flow comes from the province of Saskatchewan. So 99% is coming from Alberta, and most of that is actually uh, the mountains and foothills. Nevertheless, there are prairie uh, rivers that are substantive, and uh, as you pick, as you move north into the parkland region, the Cinnaboyne, uh, the Battle, and as we move north to North Saskatchewan, there are more reasonable inputs from the prairie landscape. So this is a, a very different rendition of the hydrological cycle than you're going to see in most textbooks. And uh, there's an awful lot of vertical transfer going on in here of uh, precip, large amounts of evapotranspiration coming back up, uh, particularly in the summertime in the prairies, uh, uh, the evapotranspiration is closely, closely coupled with the rainfall inputs. But then the seasonality of uh, very strong snow inputs in the spring, uh, which uh, governs the, the system. So that's, uh, so that's sort of a, an overview of the whole beast. Um, I'm going to uh, just show a little map and talk about some of the sites I'll be referring to. One is in a place called St. Denis. It's a national uh, uh, wildlife refuge east of Saskatoon in an upland, hummocky moraine area. So lots of internally drained lakes. Uh, internally drained lakes, we call them sloughs. The, uh, it's been cultivated and there's a transition going on to uh, forage grassland in the area right now. But it's been the subject of intensive study for a number of decades. Uh, the other is the uh, Bad Lake Research Basin that was instrumented in the 1960s by the University of Saskatchewan under the International Hydrological Decade. And uh, very intense observations there through the 60s, 70s, and 80s. It was shut down at that point, but still was a wonderful archive of observations uh, for us to go through. And it's in a more of a semi-arid part of the prairies. So not many trees in that area, short grasses, uh, still cultivated to a large degree, and another internally drained uh, lake. And then I'll make some reference to uh, measurements collected by Larry Flanagan at the Lethbridge Flux Tower site, the Mariflux site, uh, uh, which is an extremely uh, dry, semi-arid environment. And then later on, we'll go to Manitoba, but I won't show it yet. Okay, so one way to visualize, another way to visualize that prairie hydrological cycle is this way. It, uh, if we look at the winter, we've got uh, blowing snow and um, the, uh, some of that on the highway yesterday. The, uh, there's tremendous transport of snow to channels, uh, to river channels, stream channels, to wetlands, depressions, your driveway, the, um, and to uh, farmsteads. And of course, this is very important in recharging any of the sloughs. Uh, and that's where a lot of the groundwater recharge is occurring actually from the base of those sloughs. But it's also very important in runoff generation. And, the, um, and so the uh, transport of blowing snow is something we have to deal with in assessing prairie hydrology. And it's a, much, it's a sediment transport process. So if you worked on fluvial sediment transport or aeolian erosion, it's, uh, some of the same principles apply, but it's a little bit different for snow. Eventually spring comes and this stuff melts and we get runoff over the landscape, sometimes without well-defined channels at all. This one going right across a field through here. And the, um, and, uh, but in some drier years, uh, there's not much runoff at all. The snow melt waters will completely infiltrate into the frozen soils. Some of the water will be stored in wetlands, sloughs, and simply sit there, evaporate and slowly percolate into groundwater um, but in extremely wet years, as uh, was found out in the last few years in the eastern prairies, these uh, wetlands and sloughs will fill and spill. And so it's like overflowing your bathtub, and you've got a sequence of these things, and off it goes. I won't be going into that phenomena too much, but it's of tremendous interest to us right now, given the very, very wet conditions that are occurring in the eastern prairies. Um, this is the eastern prairies under more normal conditions. Uh, this is Smith Creek on the Saskatchewan-Manitoba border. And the, uh, in a dry year, it doesn't flow. Uh, that 2000 during the drought. In an average year, a uh, little bit of flow picks up in April and it goes dry in May, and that's it. And in a flood year, a bit later, peaks in late April, early May, still dry by the end of May. Um, to tell you how weird hydrology is getting in the prairies, the all-time peak flow for this creek occurred in 2014, this last summer, at the end of June and early July, when we hadn't actually recorded flow before. 
before the uh, last five years. So things are changing quite a bit, but that's the classic picture. And the, uh, in terms of prairie stream flow, the, uh, even though snowfall is a fairly small proportion of our precipitation, we have dry winters, it's the uh, lion's share of our runoff generation, so 80 to 90 percent over prairie landscapes. Is that because there's something special about snowmelt? Not particularly. Snow doesn't melt very fast compared to how quickly rain can fall on a landscape. But snowmelt is occurring at a time when soils are frozen. Uh, they may not be saturated, uh, so they may still have some infiltration capacity, but it's restricted uh, to, and limited to some degree. And it's also occurring at a time of, of year when evapotranspiration losses are very, very small. And, uh, and so it's an effective uh, uh, runoff generator. And the, uh, the fact that we have snow redistrib redistributed by blowing snow into drifts means that we'll have late lying drifts on landscapes which continue to uh, provide water into the, uh, into the water bodies uh, long after the, the main fields and hilltops have, have melted. So, the, um, so to assess this, uh, we have to put this in some kind of a uh, computer simulation framework so we can start to look at what changes to these systems might occur. And that's always been challenging because uh, many of the uh, hydrological models that have been developed have been developed in much more temperate regions. And so when we go to the SWAT model from the USDA or the, uh, um, or the Watt flood model out of southern Ontario or the SLURP model out of southern Ontario, they don't have these processes. They simply don't work here. So when we start to model prairie hydrology, we need to go back to the basic physics and the interaction of that physics with the soil properties, with the vegetation, landscape properties, and such, such a way that we can assess impacts of changing climate, land use, and uh, drainage. And that, that means we've got to incorporate these key processes, snow redistribution, frozen ground, spring runoff, wetland fill and spill, and the variable contributing area that results from all of that. And uh, then we have this problem that um, uh, uh, my supervisor, Don Gray, used to call the prairies the graveyard of hydrological models. Uh, that first computer that Tom Brown worked with in 1970 was porting up an American hydrological model uh, from apparently we're the first place outside of Washington, D.C. to run it, and it failed spectacularly in the prairies, hence the long-term research program. So we've had to work uh, towards developing something different. About uh, 16 years ago, we started developing an object-oriented modeling system called, which we call CRIM. It's a cold regions hydrological modeling platform. So it's not a model itself, but it's a way to assemble models um, from various uh, modules or components that you can bring together. And amongst those components, we have some cold regions processes that are appropriate to the uh, Canadian prairies or to the Canadian Arctic. There are permafrost components. We're adding glacier components right now. So we can configure it in a custom way for the environment and also for the, uh, uh, for the uh, uh, point of prediction in the system that we're interested in. So very often, hydrological models are focused on the stream flow. Well, as you know, when you drive across the prairie, sometimes we don't have that many streams. It doesn't mean there isn't hydrology, and perhaps our point of interest is soil moisture prediction, or groundwater recharge prediction, or simply getting the snowpack uh, for uh, uh, snow engineering purposes. So there are a number of things that we might want to predict other than stream flow, and this system allows you to focus the model based on what your point of interest is. Um, and so it, I, I, will, I won't go into great details on it, but it operates on a flexible landscape unit we call a hydrological re response unit, which can be as small as a farm field or as large as simply a crop type over a larger area. And, the, um, and we can connect these landscape units uh, uh, by, uh, of course, overland and subsurface flow, by groundwater flow, and the groundwater can be flowing in a different direction than surface water, but also aerodynamically for blowing snow. Sometimes the uh, largest amounts of water import and export into a watershed are actually by blowing snow in and out of it rather than any overland flow process.